and that we can come here to discuss a gift that you have given us, this gift of sex. And, and Father, we are so grateful for just all the blessings of life. We're thankful for a church family that is able to come together on Thursdays and Fridays and Saturdays and learn more from your word and, and encourage one another and uplift one another and be there for each other. I'm thankful for each speaker here and for all the men and all the women that have helped to put this together and to put this on and, and for um, just for faith builders in general, Father, and I ask that you help us as we look to build our faith, as we look to discover the ways that you have blessed us amazingly. Um, Father, we just give you thanks. Help us to give you thanks. Help us to have a heart of praise in all of these things. In all things, though, we give you praise. We give you honor. We give you glory. We lift up your holy and awesome name. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So yesterday we looked at God's design for sexuality. Let's see if a few of you that are new faces, um, you'll have to go back and watch some of those because uh, this will build on that a little bit. Um, but we looked at the beginning of healing emotional wounds. We all have. I think everybody to a certain extent has emotional wounds. And I know you have, have come to this class probably not to hear therapy stuff. That may not be what you had in mind, but I hope that, that yesterday was enlightening as to why that matters why the therapeutic part of healing emotional wounds matters. Um, matters to, to us, but it matters to God. And we spent a lot of time looking at, before we got into this, looking at this, looking at, at the, the heart instead of the head, right? We can spend, what I meant to say is we spend a lot of time looking at this and not so much this. And that creates a lot of issues as, as we head forward because we tell people, this is what it's all about. We go, that's fantastic. I get it. I understand it. But then when we actually go out to live out our sexual <coughs> theology, we're missing the heart. The emotions aren't there, right? And so we have a lot of hurt. We have a lot of wounds. We have a lot of things that, that before we can really start to deal with this and understanding sex, we have to feel what's going on, right? We've got to work on the heart before we work on the brain. And with that in mind, we looked at attachment yesterday, how that plays a big role in our view and our practice of sex. And so today I wanna to dive deeper into this idea of identity and internal family systems, which we'll get into, but to better determine the reasons behind the emotional issues. So we have attachment issues, right? Through attachment theory, we see the way that our relationships with our parents and with others has affected us, mainly with our parents. Today, as we look at this, I wanna get into identity. Identity. Oh, thank you. Actually, I think we're good, but it's all work. Appreciate it. <clears throat> identity. And the way I explain identity is through what I call the identity rings. At the core of who we are has to be God, right? Our relationship with God is at the very core of who we are. He is immovable. He is, he is, there's no variation or shifting shadow, right? James tells us. He is always going to be there. He's always good. He's always going to take care of us. He has to be at the center of who we are as individuals, who we are as Christians. Next we have myself, right? It's interesting. We'll look at it in a second, how we typically view this second ring. But we have myself, second. Then we have spouse. And outside of that, we have job, right? We have our family and we have our likes, our disinterests and our best friends. And as we move out, spouse, family, best friends, friends, acquaintances, and strangers, right? And we also have the other parts that make us make up who we are, job, likes, dislikes, hobbies, education, humor, if you can read that upside down. Um, this is who we are in a nutshell. All the things that make us, us, right? All these relationships. And, and it's interesting because this is how most people view this. I work with a lot of clients, and, and I had one guy that comes to mind I specifically remember, and I was brain spotting with him. I'll explain that in a little bit. Um, I was brain spotting with him, and I was working on identity, and I'm like, well, where do you think you are in your identity rings? I don't, I don't even think I'm on there. I, I don't think I'm anywhere near. He was basically outside of these rings. Like, what's your relationship with yourself? How well do you know yourself? How well do you like yourself? And this is what it comes down to is we have a lot of people who hate themselves. A lot of people who don't know how to like themselves. And they don't even consider themselves because they think it's selfish. They forget the love your neighbor as yourself and husbands love your wives as you love yourself. They forget that and they say, well, it's selfish to love yourself. 
So we have a bunch of Christians who believe that loving themselves is selfish, so they don't think that they matter. They logically know they are worthy of love, right? But they don't feel it on the deepest level. And that's what you have with Bill here, remember? So we have this idea that I know God loves me. I grasp that God loves me on this level. But the problem is, as they head down and we try to hit the heart, it bounces right back up to the head. Because it's hard to tell I don't feel God loves me. I know he does. I, I, I believe his word. I see it. I don't feel it on the deepest level. I don't feel that God loves me. So we have this disconnect there. And as we identified yesterday, what is that blockage in, in the neck that keeps it from hitting the heart? Typically, it's trauma or emotional hurt. A lot of times, abuse, things like that. Because as you say, I know God loves me. Why can't I feel it? There's something blocking that. And you have to determine what that is that blocks you from feeling like you are worthy of love. People who've experienced past trauma, who've, who've developed over time this feeling that their thoughts and their emotions, they don't matter. They come along and, and they're told to just focus on everyone else at all times, right? Joy, Jesus, others, yourself. Focus on everybody else. Focus on Christ. And the rest will, will kind of fall in line. That's well-meaning. In a lot of ways, that's great. And in some ways, that's horrible. Because as we think about those identities, right, the, those identity rings, we are nowhere to be found. Our relationship with ourself is nowhere to be found. We think of others all the time. We think of Jesus, right? So there's this deep belief that I don't matter. Everyone else matters. Everyone else for sure. But I don't matter. My emotions don't matter. And then when it comes to setting boundaries and it comes to understanding our relationship with others, we're always down here. And everybody else is always up here, right? And so we always feel like we're less than. And on the one hand, we want to serve others. We want to be there. We want to be Christ-like. And on the other hand, well, what's the problem? We're always down below. And so when you bring this into a sexual relationship with one another, what happens? We have no ability to, to set boundaries. We have no ability to understand that I matter and I what I want matters. And so we go back to this identity. And many are driven to think of others out of a sense of duty, of guilt, of, of desperation to be liked, instead of being out of a place of love. If I don't do things for everyone, for all things, for all people, at all times, I won't be fulfilling my Christian duty, right? I won't be fulfilling my Christian duty. And if I can get everyone else to love me, that will inform me that I'm worthy of love. So what we have is we are taking it from the outside. We're saying, if I can get strangers and acquaintances and friends and fam best friends and family, if everybody loves me, that'll tell me that this circle is I'm worthy of love, right? I'm worthy of love. Because I spent all my time thinking of other people. And what happens the moment that this guy who I held the door open for doesn't give me thanks? What happens when this person who I really helped, they turn their back on me. This friend hurt me really badly. I say, what gives? Man, I've done everything for you. Because the way we're motivated is by trying to get everybody else to like us. Because ultimately, we don't like ourselves. But if they like me, maybe they'll tell me I'm worthy of love. Maybe they'll tell me I'm worthy of being like, right? And instead, we've got to turn it the other way around. We've got to go inside out and recognize God loves us most. He loves us. And because God loves us, I can love myself. And because I love myself, it emanates from there. And my love for my spouse doesn't run out because it's not flipped around. It's not going from a place of I need my spouse to love me. It's going from a place of I love myself and I know I'm worthy of love. And because I'm worthy of love, at my very worst, because of this, because of God at the center, she's worthy of love too. So is my family, so are my best friends, my friends, my acquaintances, and strangers are worthy of love because I didn't think I was, but God showed me that I was, right? So there's this deep theology involved with our self-worth, with who we are. We should be reversing that order, recognizing that a strong sense of self comes from God's deep love for us, and our worth is based solely on the fact that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's where our worth is based. That fact cannot be disputed or shaken the way that anybody else is can. Spouses can leave. Family members can die. Best friends can turn their back on you. God never will. So we always have a deep sense of who we are. So what does this have to do with sex? When you take this into marriage, you see a few things. First, you see people who have no idea how to set boundaries, especially in the bedroom. They feel that they are supposed to do whatever they can to fulfill their husband's pornographic fantasies or something like that. You second, you have people who basically have no joy in sex because they've been told it's about the other person. It's about the other person, right? Their personal fulfillment in sex is selfish. So they never think about that. And in reality, sex is about trying to help the other person feel the best that they can. But that goes both ways. Both have to be doing that at the same time. 
right? And so when it doesn't matter to the other person, we find out that they don't think they're worthy of telling the other person, this is not fun. This is not healthy. This is not good. Well, my job is just to give and give and give and give because I don't matter, right? Third, you have people who define their worth and value through the eyes of their spouse. If they get in a fight, their value plummets. The strains marriages, it makes intimacy on the deepest level through sex nearly impossible. Nearly impossible. Marriage becomes a yo-yo of feeling loved, feeling worthy of being loved, to feeling worthless and being unable to have worth based on the fights, based on the, the emotional issues taking place in the marriage. One moment I'm on top of the world and the next I'm, I'm down here. I don't matter in the marriage. So our identity is deeply, deeply skewed in those situations. And when you don't feel worthy enough, it's easy to act out in a negative sexual way, like through adultery, through pornography, through self-pleasuring and more. And then when we, when, when we do act out sexually, what do we feel? Extreme shame, right? Extreme shame. It feeds the feelings of worthlessness. We felt worthless, we acted out, we go back to feeling worthless. You know, what is the deal here? Well, we're doing the same things over and over and over. Trying to, to it's, it's the Einstein idea of insanity, right? Trying the same thing again and again and expecting a different result. It doesn't happen. So I often ask my clients, I say, when does God love you more? When you are sitting in church, worshiping him, or when you're looking at porn? Most of them get it wrong, actually, believe it or not. Most of them get it wrong. You'd be surprised at how many say he loves me more when I'm sitting in church. God loves you the exact same. He loves you the exact same. It's a trick question designed to get them to see God's love does not waver based on your sin, based on your shame. If it did, we'd be toast. If it did, this wouldn't be at the center, would it? It has to be something concrete, and God's love is concrete. So many get them wrong. But to truly feel love on the deepest level, you have to work through the trauma keeping you from feeling love. And then come into contact with Christ's love and allow that to emanate onward and outward, right? But we have to understand and be willing and able to receive love. It's the idea of what I talked about yesterday, trauma turning or connectors into protectors, right? Instead of connecting, instead of feeling like we're worthy of love, feeling like we're worthy of connection, we protect and we turn out and we say, I'm not worthy of that. I don't want that. I can't, I don't deserve that. And it plummets our self-worth and our identity. <laughs> then when you feel fully loved and you feel cared for by Christ, when we finally get this right, despite your sin, you can give others what he gives others. You can give others out of an overflowing cup. Your love for others won't run dry because you recognize true love instead of this, instead of this fake love of never setting any boundaries doing everything for all people just because you're trying to get them to to tell you that you're worthy of love that's fake and we run out and it runs dry i want to know is that lust after god's true love do we lust for all these things and we put a uh, counterfeit name to it love because I think we, we we have full love here but as we expand out we're lusting for ourselves, our mate to find that love and we're not relying on that in the world mm -hmm. You know, so we're searching for some that. I think that's exactly it. I think we're all searching for love. That's why God says it's not good for man to be alone. Right. At our deepest level is a need for intimacy and love that's right. and connection. When we go outside and we try yeah. to find it in the outer ones, it's that's our right. desire to replicate what only God can give us. Right. Right. And so when we try to replicate what only God can give us, it's cheap. It cracks. It's, a, right. it's not a solid foundation. So, yeah, in that way, we end up lusting for something that... Is it wrong to, to lust after something that God has said? It's free. It's, it's free. free. Right. Come to me, right? We want that, but we just do it in, in horrible ways. That's what that I mean. Sense. So it's really disguised, and we make yeah. excuses for that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, no, no, no. Good stuff. So while we're talking about shame, though, I want to go off on, on shame for a bit, because I think it's important to discuss the church's horrible response to anything sexual. <laughs> horrible response it seems that we saw the sexual revolution in the 60s right we flipped out said no we're not we're not going to come anywhere near that again we don't want people to to be pursuing things that are horrible which is great that's true but how we went about it was terrible and even before that the church's sexual theology was practically non-existent even before the 60s i i don't think there's i was talking to um denny petrillo uh, president of bear valley a couple months back and i was telling him about some of the stuff and 
and he's been keeping up with some of the things I've been working on. And, um, he was talking about when he wrote the commentary on Song of Solomon, even back in Jewish times, 2,000 years ago, they, were, they didn't want to talk about sex. They didn't want to have anything to do with sex. Um, and so that's when you started getting into, as we talked about yesterday, that's, well, that's all a metaphor for something else, which is not true. But um, I, I think it's, it's very interesting that for thousands of years, God's people have been like, we don't want to discuss those things, right? So it's not just us. I'm not just blaming the church members of the 50s and 60s, but it goes back a long ways. But we had the world telling us at the same time, you're a sexual being. This is part of who you are, right? This is part of who you are. It's part of your identity, and it's important. It should feel good. It should be a part of who you are. And we had a ton of people go, you know what? That's, that's right. That makes sense. And the world was not fully wrong. We have to realize the world was not fully wrong now. It is part of our identity. It is part of who we are. The problem with this is that this is what the world did. They put sex and gender at the center of your identity. They've made that who you are. LGBTQ is nothing but look what I identify as, yeah. is this. And so their sex is at the very center of who they are instead of God. I choose to put sex as part of that middle or that, that second tier, the myself, that's part of who you are. It's an important part of who you are. There's a reason God designed you as male or female. There's a reason for the sex. We'll get into why gender is a constructive term. It's stupid from John Money but in, in the next session. But sex is important. When the world came along and said it is important, Christians went, uh, and some said, yep, it is, and we went this way, and others said, nope, it's not, and they went this way. And we have this huge chasm in the church of people who aren't able to understand where sex fits into God's design. But the world has been dictating for so long anything having to do with sex that we don't know anything other than shame. Because we recognize that sexuality is a part of the way God created us, but does it not seem like we do so begrudgingly? We, we kind of, yeah, yeah, you're, it is, it is, we really don't want to talk about that, right, we'll keep the lid on it. So we do it begrudgingly, and the world comes along and goes, hey, check this out. And we have a lot of kids that go, well, it does feel good, and it doesn't seem wrong, right? There are more people nowadays, there are more kids, this is a Barna study, that believe recycling is more wrong than pornography. There are more kids that believe that these days. That recycle, or not recycling, rather, is more wrong than doing pornography. So we have an entire generation that is completely illiterate when it comes to sexual sin, but they don't know any better because we haven't done a great job of carrying the mantle forward saying this is why we don't. We said don't do it, as we looked at yesterday, the do not, right, the donuts, the donut theology. <clears throat> but we're failing people because all we can come along and do is, is point out shame. The world comes along and starts discussing sexual things, and the church has no answer because we'd rather bury our heads in the sand. We get unbelievably uncomfortable with, with anything having to do with sex, and the world knows that. They get that. That's why they are, are trumpeting things so much when we're not. And while we're pretending like aspects of, of sex, like arousal and orgasm, don't exist, the public schools and TikTok and, and social media and, and the workplace and everybody else is happy to discuss those things. And so you have five-year-olds that understand these terms, and you have seven-year-olds that won't use it. We're wondering why we're losing so many kids to this movie why we're losing so many people in the church or why so many people are sexually broken in the church. Would you rather gravitate towards something that seems like fun, super positive, or towards feigning ignorance and acting like anything having to do with sex is dirty and horrible? Just from a personal perspective, I'm saying remove, obviously we know what's right and wrong, remove the right and wrong for a second and say which would you more likely go toward? Something that's fun or something that's not? Running away from something or running towards something? From a, from a psychological perspective, we know people would much rather run toward something. The thing is, in the church, we have something to run toward. Sex is ours. God designed it. So when we ask people to, to run away from something, we should be telling them, run toward this. But we don't. We just say, run away from this, right? And the world goes, how about you run toward this? And they go, sounds good to me. Because I'd rather run toward than away. And when we continue to act like sex is only for procreation, the world is advancing a very aggressive agenda, trying to take a God-given gift and perverting it. And we're letting them. The reality is that things like sex are very fun, and God designed them that way. We shouldn't be running from them. 
The world acts like sex is amazing, and we act like it's not. How many Christian marriages do you know where the woman absolutely hates it and the man feels sexually frustrated and stifled? It's a lot. It's a lot. I work with them. Why do we act like it's a chore or something dirty when God created it? We've taken what God created, and we said, we don't talk about that. We don't want that. We'll do it in a, in a proper context, which is true, in marriage, but we're not going to talk even about that, about why it's important to keep it in the proper context, why God designed it as, as part of marriage. We don't want to talk about that. If I'm right in my assertion that the church runs from these things, that it shames anything sexual, then I think we'd see a few things. I think we'd see, first off, <laughs> Christians who struggle in knowing how to handle a single teenage mom. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. Right? Come on. Come down that road. <laughs> we treat every porn addict as a perv. Mm. We wouldn't realize that 65 to 70 percent of every man, statistically in a church, specifically 50 and under, but I've worked with some in their 70s, 50 and under are looking at porn uh -huh. once a week. Yep. Every single one of them must be a perv, right? Or maybe we misunderstand the problem. If I was right that the church is, is shaming all things sexual, then I think the push for these two-plus years engagements where young couples would see those, which we do, right? You go, well, what's wrong with that? I don't know. I, I know I struggle, okay? I know I struggle staying pure to the fact that I didn't. Why? Because we, when we push for these two-year engagements, plus, we're acting like, oh, they're not sexual. How could they possibly be sexual? Are you kidding me? Okay. Are you kidding me? If I, I'm not going to ask, but a show of hands, if I ask how many people remain pure to the altar, my guess would be not a ton would go up. They've done this in other churches in Christendom. Less than 5% of the hands went up. This is what you'd see. When we don't talk about sex, we don't talk about how difficult it might be to be pure until marriage. This is what you'd see. Well, make sure everything's set right, as though we're not aroused, as though we don't want that. It's natural to want it. It's good to want it. It's horrible to do it outside of marriage. Maybe we should understand that. I'm not saying rush into marriage to have sex. That's not at all what I'm saying. But I'm saying, if you know, you know, why are we prolonging these things and pushing people into massive temptation if they don't? If the world, or if the church rather, did not have an understanding of sex, an appropriate understanding, we would see Christians who never address how a couple might have a better sex life. I don't think we see that in the church too much. We'd also see the shame of rape victims for their clothing choices. I know personally a woman who did this. They had a, a girl come forward, they were doing ladies class, girl came forward, said, what do you do about a rape victim? And she blamed her for the clothing choices that she wore. This is what happens. This is what happens. It's horrible. But when we don't talk about it, these things are the result. How about we hush sexual abuse in the church? i got a client right now who is abused at three years old. And the church tried to hush it. The guy never went to prison. He abused three separate kids in the same class. Never went to prison. The church just kicked him out and acted like it went away. The guy's still out on the street somewhere. That has happened multiple times that I am aware of. That's just one I'm currently working with. We would also have no idea how to handle someone struggling with same-sex attraction or gender dysphoria. Um, this is what would happen if, if the church did not have a strong sexual theology. Does any of these look familiar? Uh, all of these look familiar, right? That's the problem. So when we when we act like, should we be discussing this? I don't know. Should we? Right? Should we be discussing? Yes, because these things are very real, and people are hurting, and people are are having going through the worst things possible, and this is what we're leading them to. So when you consider identity, when we get back to this identity, this is the shame piece. This is what shame pushes us into, is ignoring the issue while the world, while the church really is allowing the world in. The church is suffering, but we're ignoring the issues. So when we consider identity, what do you think happens to the average Christian's identity when they do struggle with one or more of these sexual sins? Their entire identity is taken over with shame. I can speak from personal experience on this with a 10 plus year or right around 10 year addiction to porn, getting out of the shame cycle is unbelievably difficult. You feel shame, you wanna get out of shame, you, you do something to act out right to get out of shame and you go right back into the shame. And so it's the cycle that continues and continues and continues. And this is what the average Christian who has dealt with anything sexual, any struggle, what they feel like. Their entire identity is taken over with shame. We don't know how to handle it because we come forward, there's even more shame. People don't know how to handle somebody coming forward. And having worked with dozens of clients concerning their sexuality, I can tell you most people in church feel very broken sexually. They're in various states of shame surrounding their sexuality. So when shame becomes part of our identity, especially concerning our sexuality, it can wreak havoc on us, it can wreak havoc on our lives. There's only one thing that can break through it. 
It's grace. It's the grace of Christ. It's recognizing that God still loves us even in our worst. Even in our most shameful state, that's when he came to die for us. We're going to look more at this, um, excuse me, in the keynote that I have tomorrow with finding hope in the dark places, finding hope in the midst of, of sexual shame, right? There's hope to be found, but it's only through the gospel. It's only through Christ. God sees you, and he loves you more than anything, and he offers grace to even the deepest of, of sex addicts, even the deepest of, of those who have dealt with the most sexual trauma possible. And in the depth of our sexual sins and struggles, the grace of Christ can be found. That's why he's at the, at the center, right? He's the core of who we are, because this is always offered, as long as we're willing to come back to him. So as we consider our sexual wounds, there's there's one more piece that I want to look at. Um, and that is the idea of internal family systems. This is a book. I don't know if my wife brought it in. I'll, I'll bring it. If anybody wants to look at it, called No Bad Parts. It's kind of a big one um, for IFS. But the idea of internal family systems was created by Richard Schwartz. He's, he's kind of the, the foremost expert on IFS. Um, and this is the classic picture. This is what you'll see. If you look up IFS, this literally was taken. This is one of the second, first or second off Google. Um, there's various ones that you can find. That's the easiest. Nobody sue me for that, please. I, I, you know, I, I put it down there, so that's where I got it. Uh, this is not mine, but this is the idea of IFS. And what you have is you have managers, you have the firefighters, you have the exiles in the midst of self. So the self is the core, the center of the person, as you see. Um, managers are the protectors of the system, such as the controller, the judge, the planner, the critic, etc. cetera. Uh, they try to keep you in control in every situation, right? They want to manage. They keep you in control. The exiles are the painful emotions we don't want to experience. So we basically kick them out of the family circle. These emotions may be rage, shame, fear, terror, loneliness, grief, and loss we discussed yesterday. Um, those are the things we don't want to feel so they get kicked out. And then the firefighters come along, and they're to protect. But they act as, the, as, as when the exiles pop up, then the firefighters kick in. When we begin to feel lonely, we begin to feel shameful. The firefighters rush in to make things okay, and they do that through addictions, they do that through violence, through self-harm, um, dissociation, they do that through maybe compulsions, right? Um, even through sleep, through work, through exercise, and those become the firefighters and they keep us from feeling the things that we really need to work through. They keep the exiles on the outside. I like to visualize it this way. You have your internal family table. This is all happening inside. And sometimes clients are like, what is happening? I don't fully understand this. Um, I think of having multiple people inside you who you are. You have this internal family table. And at the table, you have certain people, such as maybe your critic. And, and the critic may sit at the top of the table. He may be at a different place. You have your, maybe your electrician, right? He turns the lights out. When things get too emotional, he comes in, turns the lights out. You got your Mr. Nice Guy. Everybody gets along with him. He's, he's pink, see? Oh. He's nice. There's, Nothing threatening about him, right? He's Mr. Nice Guy. He keeps saying to make sure everybody likes him. Maybe you got King Baby. This is the one who goes into to victimization. Everybody's against me. Everything goes wrong, right? And sometimes he kicks in, and we start feeling sorry for ourselves, and King Baby comes out. Sometimes you got the rage monster, right? He gets really angry when he starts feeling threatened, or, or he's the first one to pop up, and he just gets very angry and rageful. Maybe you've got the actor, one who comes along and acts around other people. And maybe he, he works alongside with Mr. Nice Guy, but he just fits in with wherever he needs to go in order to get himself loved, in order to feel like he's okay. So he acts around other people. Nobody really knows the real him because he's afraid to show the real him. That's part of the exiles, right? He pops up to make sure nobody actually knows the real him. <laughs> maybe you've got the addict, right? This, is, this would be the addict internally. The one who engages in pornography use, the one who engages in, in drugs or in, um, in alcohol, something like that. And then you have more, of course, sitting at the table. And for those struggling with their sexual behavior, <coughs> we have to identify who's outside the house, right? Who's the addict here? Who's the one that's looking in to the family table going, I, I want to be there. And then everybody else at the table is going, no, you don't. No, you don't. We don't want you inside the house because you pose a threat. When you pop up, when you show up, you pose a threat. So what is the addict trying to cover for? Past shame, right? Maybe. Past sadness, past hurt. Had one just this morning, doing a session with a guy just this morning. And working on some of this stuff, 
he has a lot of shame from being sexually abused as a young kid. Lots and lots of shame. And the more the shame comes up, the more rageful he gets and the rage monster comes out. And the more, and, and really the shame and, and the rage, it's interesting, those seem to be more present at the table. You know what's not? He won't allow himself to be hurt. He won't, he won't feel deep hurt. He'll feel some sadness, he'll feel a lot of anger, he'll feel some shame, but he will not feel hurt. So we have to identify why is hurt outside the house? Why is hurt not allowed to come in? What would the other members have to say if hurt was to walk through that door? And so we start having this conversation internally with ourselves, right? So if you're struggling with finding sex enjoyable in your marriage, could it be that you have a protector, a protector at that table, keeping you from being hurt sexually again? Is hurt the exile? The same way like with my client this morning, is hurt the exile that's not welcome in your house? If you struggle to be open in your marriage, could it be that a feeling of an inadequacy or fear of losing that love is the exile? I don't even want him nearby, so I'm going to overcompensate. I'm going to have a member of that family pop up and make sure that I don't feel what I probably need to feel, but I don't want to because it threatens everything inside. If I were to feel the fear of, of losing love, if I was to feel the inadequacy, and that was actually to step through the door, that would wreck my entire life. I'd just be a sobbing kid, right? I can't do that. That would, that would destroy everything I built up to be a really solid person. And so we run from that, and we have the entire family work in tandem, work together to make sure that we don't feel those things. So we have all sorts of ways to cope with and to compensate for the emotions that we don't want to feel. And if you have unresolved and unprocessed emotions that you haven't allowed at your table, in your mind, and in your heart, your sexuality is, is probably going to be one of the first things to be affected. Why is that? That's the deepest part, one of the deepest parts of who you are. It's not, it's not the core, right? But it's one of the deepest parts of who you are. Your ability to connect, your intimacy. There's a reason we call intimacy sex, though, again, as I mentioned, I don't like that per se. Intimacy is a lot more than just sex, but your sexuality is one of the most coveted, like, holy things that God has presented you with. And it's one of the quickest ways to fake love, to get love. That's why people run to sex so quickly is because it feels like love to me. It feels like I'm naked and somebody's allowed to see that and they're showing me that themselves. And so they must love me. Now, that may not be true, right? There's a lot of people who don't love each other that are doing that, but it feels like that. So it can replicate what we're trying to get ourselves. Back to your point, right? Um, it's also the fast track <clears throat> to feeling accepted by other people. It may be fake. It may be cheap. But man, it feels like love and it feels like acceptance. And so we quickly run to sex, to porn, to fornication, to adultery, uh, and more. And so if you're struggling sexually in any way, I challenge you to notice your emotional state and try to determine who the exile is. Who is it that I'm not dealing with? Who is it? What part of me, what emotion inside of me am I keeping under wraps and pushing to the outside? This will absolutely affect your sex life. So you say, why does this matter in a, in a talk on sexuality? It very much matters. It will affect your sex life first and foremost, in my opinion, because you won't allow yourself to be fully open. If you can't be fully open and accepting of yourself, how are you going to let other people do it? Right. <laughs> right? How are you going to let other people do it? So we want to identify who this is in your life bring him in and have that conversation and who stands up and sometimes the critic stands up and he goes you have no right to be here you're this 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 and the interesting thing is i i always ask two questions i say when the critic it's almost always that case the critic stands up and shouts down the exile i first say who's the voice of the critic who do they sound like and almost always it sounds like my parents okay. Okay. that's the voice of my parents <laughs> the second question i ask is I say, what is that? What is their motivation? What is the critic's motivation for shouting them down and for moving them out? You think, well, just to be a jerk, right? Just to, because they're mean. That's not actually true. The critic's motivation almost always is to protect. He's at the head because he protects everybody else. And he says, you shouldn't be here because if you did, everything would fall apart. So I criticize you so as to protect you, so as to protect everybody else. And it's a real interesting, as you start holding this conversation with these people in their minds, really interesting because I say, what's the critic have to say? It's usually really mean. And I say, okay, what does the exile have to say? What does the shame have to say back to the critic? Really interesting. Um, some of the responses that you get, but you hold these dialogues and it starts to help people work through all of the emotions that they're struggling with. <laughs> as we think about struggling with emotions, um, when we feel depressed, rejected, bored, worthless, inadequate, rage, guilt, stress, insignificant, shame, alone, and unlovable, when we feel these things, 
what are we what do we run to right what do we run to because in reality what we need in those moments when we're feeling those are acceptance validation affirmation compassion calm comfort relief control freedom or agency sense of worth connection encouragement support forgiveness nurture intimacy and love that's what we need so what do we do we act out sexually we needed this we wanted this we were feeling those things and all we needed to stop feeling unlovable is to feel love but in order to to feel to get out of feeling those things we act out sexually trying to go around it what's the problem with that it sends us right back into it because we try to run away from being bored or we try to run, run away from being stressed and then we go back into shame and being even more stressed because I acted out sexually. We run from, from feeling unlovable, we act out sexually, and we're right back to feeling unlovable, even more so. And in reality, we needed to deal with this, everything in the middle. We needed that, that validation. We needed all of those positive emotions, but we run from those. We have to invite the exiles, the things that we don't want to deal with. We have to invite all the emotions into the room. we got to give them what they need, which ultimately, all of these lead to that. That's why I put it last. They all lead to love. Every last one of them. God had got put inside of us a deep desire to be loved. And we have to give these exiles the ability to say what they need, to tell us what's actually going on. So circling back... <clears throat> When we talk about healing emotional wounds, we looked at how to heal some of these things, and, and really it's through attachment, through identity, and through internal family. Now, we do a few other things as well. These are some of the main ones um, that I'll do of how we can better work through emotional wounds. I had mentioned EMDR. Um, I mentioned brain spotting. There's TFCBT, which is trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. That's more for kids. They're working on, I, I like, developing up to maybe 29 years old right now. It works up basically 3 to 25. So for kids, I'll use that. Um, for EMDR, is anybody familiar with that? Eye movement, desensitization, or reprocessing, and the idea is you bounce your eyes back and forth. So I had, um, Tanya was asking yesterday, maybe to explain some of those. You bounce your eyes back and forth. Brain spotting was founded by David Grant, who was doing EMDR when he did it, and he noticed clients' eyes would get stuck. And so they bounce back and forth, and there's taps and bilateral sounds and, and flashes and such in EMDR, and it helps you process through the trauma. Brain spotting is something I do, which is you track and then when you notice, you get them highly activated or triggered emotionally, and then they'll stay on the spot. The idea is where you look affects how you feel. And so we'll talk back and forth, and I'll have them look at that spot when they're in a heavy emotional state, and it really helps with the trauma. Part of the way that it works um, is, is, so let's say like in a car wreck, a lot of people will have the rear view mirror, right? Um, I, I work with people in, in different settings, and with shame, I typically, if they're feeling a lot of shame over something, I typically do the brain spot on the floor because everybody looks down in shame, right? If they're talking to a parent, I found one guy, he, he was sitting on the bed, his mom came into the room, his mom was very verbally abusive, and I said, well, what part of the room is the bed in? And he told me, and I said, okay, when she walks in, I want you to look up to the left, which is where she would have been. And he just started shaking like he was going down on an airplane. And um, we were able to work through the trauma because that's where his mother's face was in his eyes. And so he was doing this, he didn't want to look, and then the more we did it, the more bold he got. So those are ways that you can process through trauma. It's very, very interesting. It sounds weird. Um, I thought it was really weird the first time. It was explained to me when I started. I had it done to me. Um, I, I trained in it, and then they're like, well, before you do it, you should have it done to you. And it was really weird and mind-blowing. Um, it works very, very well. So those are some of the things we can do to heal emotional wounds. Um, how are we doing on time? 327. 327. Perfect. Okay. I have till 3.45, right? Yes. Okay. This is the part that I added, like, four more slides. So um, <laughs> I, was thinking, I was thinking we were going to go short, possibly, so it's good. Um, <clears throat> so in sessions two and three, we, as we looked at, first session we talked about the spiritual implications, right, of sex. We're going to get into it a little more, especially in session five. Um, these last two have been about the emotional. So as we're working toward the physical, I can tell you all sorts of things about maybe how to improve your sex life. We're actually going to get into those. But if you don't work through the emotional trauma that's keeping you from being able to connect, your sex life is going to be horrible. I'm just going to tell you that. Uh, your sexuality is always going to be a struggle for you until you start to recognize the spiritual implications and why it matters to God, how to work through the emotional. And the next one, we're going to get into the intellectual and how we, how we actually view it intellectually. And then we'll get into how to have the best sex life and why it matters um, physically. And so that's kind of where, we, where I wanted to leave it off. Um, what I want to get into now, though, is we've, we've explored the, um, uh, the attachment wounds <clears throat> and seeing what they brought into the relationship. 
the identity, whether it's full of shame and self-loathing or whether you can actually love yourself, um, seeing if the exiles are hiding outside that you're afraid to let in. And then I was asked yesterday, can you do something a little more practical? This is all therapeutic based. If you are struggling with this, I would say, yes, I'm a therapist, so I will play therapy. Get yourself a therapist. Um, if, you, if you recognize that some of these things are real issues with the last three that we just said, um, if you recognize that you're struggling in those ways, I would get yourself a therapist. Not every therapist is gonna do this. If you're gonna go through like psychology today, make sure they do IFS, internal family systems. Um, they specialize in attachment, something like that. The identity is something that I've kind of created, but people do identity work, it just won't look like that because the identity rings is something I created. Um, but find yourself a therapist to work through these things, is what I would say. Doing it on your own, while I've tried to come to grips with certain things, I can help you do certain things. We actually brain spot on your own. I brain spotted myself before. Uh, you gotta know how to do it. So you gotta know how to reparent on your own as well. We looked at reparenting. You can do it on your own, but not initially. Um, and so I would say get yourself a therapist. Now, for the more practical side of things, um, to increase intimacy, because this is kind of the question that was asked, and I wanna get practical here for a little bit. Um, what are ways to increase intimacy? First, on the spiritual level, pray, read, and study, read or study scripture, and work on overcoming sins together in your marriage. If you want to get intimate on the bottom level, on that spiritual level, they got to know you to the deepest part. They got to know your spiritual struggles, what you're dealing with from a spiritual spiritual level, right? So pray, read and study, work on overcoming sins, and find ways to serve God together. I think this is huge for a marriage, is when you have two people that are individuals trying to get themselves to heaven, and you're not really thinking about the fact that we're supposed to be one flesh, well, this affects your intimacy. This affects your ability to grow together. So in what ways are you serving God in your marriage with one another? So find ways. Get, get on the deepest level spiritually that you can. <clears throat> Create love maps. Um, this is something from, from, as I mentioned yesterday, Gottman Institute, John and Julie Gottman. i got two separate slides. Um, I can get you my slides if you're interested. This is just from his, um, from his book, Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work. He actually posted this on Twitter, so I stole it from him. Um, everything goes to the Gottmans. This is not something I came up with. But name your partner's two closest friends. What's your partner's favorite musical group, composer, or instrument? What was your partner wearing when you first met? What are your partner's hobbies? Where, are your part where was your partner born? What stresses are facing your partner in the immediate future? Describe in detail your partner's day, either today or yesterday. When is your, part uh, is your partner's birthday? What is the day of your anniversary? What is your partner's most favorite relative? What is your partner's fondest dream, as yet unachieved? What is your partner's favorite flower? What is one of your partner's greatest disaster scenarios? What is your partner's favorite time for making love? What makes your partner feel most confident? What turns your partner on sexually? What is your partner's favorite meal? What is your partner's favorite way to spend an evening? What is your partner's favorite color? What personal improvements does your partner want to make in, and that got cut off, sorry. Um, <clears throat> I believe it's in their life. What improvements do they want to make in their life? If you don't know these things, start here. If you want to build intimacy, if you want to build love with one another, start here. Do you know your spouse? Do you know everything about them? Are you trying to know everything about them? Because as we talked about, most people want to flip the intimacy pyramid upside down and start with sex on the, on the bottom. And they want to say, we'll grow intimate through sex. It's not the way it works. You have to grow up. You have to grow from spiritual into emotional into intellectual. These things are a blend of those, right? Because he's Jewish, he doesn't get into the spiritual as much. Um, John Gottman, that is. But there's really good stuff for the emotional and the intellectual um, that you can run to for these love maps. The idea of creating a love map is so you know your partner. You can read your partner better. If you want a better sex life, if you want to be better or more intimate, this is how you start. Also, um, work on communication patterns. We had, I had talked a little bit about this yesterday with increasing communication. And I had explained the communication pyramid, as I've come up with, there's probably multiple. And the idea is the why, the how, and the what. Now, the what is on the bottom, takes the most time, it has the most, right? We can talk about the what all day long. Um, what did you do here? What was your day like? What happened? Did you pick this up in the store? Did you take the kids to soccer practice? Whatever it is, that's, that's all the what of the communication. Then we get into money. And all we want to talk about, or we get into sex, and all we want to talk about, we fight all the time, right? Because we're so busy being caught up on, if I can just get them to understand what I'm saying, everything will, everything will work, right? <laughs> everything will go. And the problem is, 
They don't care. <laughs> the why is <laughs> They don't care. Right? And how you're doing it, you're berating them, and they go, my ears are shut off. There's actually been studies done that when it reach, reaches a certain decibel for the yellers in the room, when it reaches a certain decibel, the other person's ears will shut off. Yeah. They uh, will not hear. Yeah. So I reached 130 decibels trying to get you to understand what I'm saying. Why can't you get it? It's like, well, my ears shut off at 90. Um, I didn't catch that. And so we spend all the time on the what, and what we have to do is we work our way up, right? Instead of focusing so much on the what, we say, how are we communicating? And then if we really want to understand why we're, why we're not connecting down here, we've got to get to why are we doing this in the first place? Why are we even communicating, right? Because if we don't know why we're communicating, then the what really doesn't matter. We have to be able to work our way up and then work our way down. Once we are in the same, what are we trying to get out of this conversation, right? This conversation about money. In reality, most people are on the same page. They both want to, they want money to, to serve them in some way. We can agree on that. Now, one wants to have a ton of fun. One wants to be super conservative and keep it in the bank. Well, what are we trying to get? We have to go into why money represents to us what it does. Why does that matter? Why does it matter to you to have it in the bank? And why does it matter to you to have fun? Well, we always had in the bank and my family never did anything. I want to have fun. Or we always had in the bank and, and that's my security. Or... I never had money. Now that I have money, I don't want to just put it in a bank because I was dirt poor growing, right? There's certain things as to why you're doing it, why you believe what you believe, then you can work your way down. Another thing that I um, that I work on, I think this is a Gottman thing, but turn in, not out. So when you have a problem, a lot of people want to turn away from one another and try to figure out the problem themselves. And the idea is we got to turn into each other. I teach this in premarital counseling quite a bit. You turn in and not away from it. You turn in and not out. Because as we deal with all sorts of problems, problems are plentiful. We will always have problems in marriage. We will always have communication issues. Are you turning in to solve it with your spouse or are you turning out? If you're turning toward yourself to try to fix it, that's part of the problem. You want good intimacy, but every single time there's a problem, you figure, you cowboy this thing and figure it out yourself. <laughs> well, go figure. Your wife wants a part, right? She wants to have some say in, in figuring out the problem. You turn into one another and you help that and things get much better. My wife and I have this rule in our marriage, 15 minute rule. Um, if you are still thinking about it 15 minutes later, talk to your spouse about it. And you can do a day, I would not start with, if you've never done this, my advice to people is always start with something you both feel comfortable with. Probably not 15 minutes. I would say maybe, sometimes it's a week. If you're really bad and you're really in the depth of bitterness, sometimes it's a week. Sometimes it's a day. We try to get it down to 15 minutes. I probably will have a talk after because I was late and she was mad at me. Um, <laughs> so she's probably been thinking about it for the last 60 minutes or so. Um, so if you're thinking about it, in 15 minutes, we will talk about it. Why? Because bitterness kills intimacy. Bitterness puts the other person in the depreciation room, right? Nothing they do. I brought you flowers. Oh, hi, you're in the dog. What, what were you bringing flowers for? What did you do wrong? Right? Hey, let's go out to eat. Trying to schmooze me. What's going on? Right? What's really going on? Right? Everything that the person does well, it's like, oh, there's always a negative. No, it's because you've got them in bitterness. You got them in the depreciation room. Get them out. How do we do that? We talk through all our problems. You go, I, I don't even want to bring up a problem in three weeks. Why would I bring one up after 15 minutes? The thing is, when you start working through all of the bitterness, this becomes a lot easier. It keeps you from getting bitter. Because what it does is, is every small thing you go, that's not the hill I want to die on. Well, I won't die on this hill either. And it's like, you don't die on any hills, and then you die on all of them. Like, <laughs> that's the issue. You have so many hills that you didn't die on that you are you can't even walk a straight path in your marriage. Some, some things are very worth it. And to be honest, anything past 15 minutes to me is worth it. And we don't have bitterness in our marriage because we work through these things very quickly. Um, you learn a lot of better communication styles and habits, too, when you are doing this because... I don't want to have a knockdown drag out over something that was fairly minor. Yes, I was thinking about it 15, 30 minutes later, but at the end of the day, no, we're not, we're not gonna, you know, nobody sleep on the couch type of thing. Um, no, don't ever sleep. Don't ever push somebody to the couch either. I'm not a big fan of that either. But this really helps with bitterness coming down. <clears throat> stop the tropes. Um, this speaks to putting them on the couch. Wives, stop putting your husbands in the doghouse, doing the silent treatment, and taking your hormones out on them. Okay. I, I'm just going to say it. Wives, stop doing it. Um, in no way is this scriptural and is this okay. And, well, my husband's sleeping on the couch tonight. He better not be. It's his house. He's a man. Okay? He is a man. And the way God designed it is a patriarchal system. The man is the man. Now, husbands, 
Stop escaping to your man cave or your work or your hobbies to get away from your wife because real men don't get emotional. Okay? Talk to your wife. Spend time with your wife. Take her out to eat. Love on your wife. Take time to be with her and to care about her. And the small things that you go, this doesn't mean anything to me. It means everything to her. It should mean something to you. Right? So when we are dealing with creating intimacy, these things kill it very, very quickly. Because the guy's in the doghouse and he's going to work his way out of it. It's garbage. It's absolute garbage. Because the hierarchical structure and in structural family therapy, Salvador Mnuchin, he very much went into this. And he was, he was not a Christian, but he realized there will be a hierarchy in the family. There absolutely will be. Who's going to be on top? God designed a hierarchy in the family. Why would we go in and change anything? Why would we go in and make it any different? So this speaks to both of them. Husbands, we cannot run. We have to lead. We have to be the one who takes the lead. And when the marriage is on the ropes and when things aren't good, what are you doing about it? God gave our wives for us to cherish and for us to take our marriage seriously. And it's not wrong for men to cry. And it's not wrong for men to get emotional. It's not wrong for men to take charge, to take lead in the marriage and to create intimacy. What are, what are tropes? Oh, those are um, the... the uh, what am I looking for? Um, stereotypes, basically. Stereotypes. stereotypes. Yeah. yeah. So these are kind of like a, if you see a sitcom trope, um, that's the, the the dumb dad is kind of a Disney trope, right? It's something that they roll out on every single okay. show. Um, it's that type of thing. The stereotypes. This is this is what we typically write, right? Yeah, I'm not a big fan of the way Disney does things. Here's another fun one. Since we're since we're having so much fun right now. Yeah. <laughs> Here's another fun one. Sure we I used to do this a lot. Now that everything's online, I can't do this as much, which stinks. If you have Legos, which for those who have kids, you probably have them and have stepped on them a million times. If you have Legos, get yourself a set of Legos that are matching. Okay? Probably about 10 Legos. If you do a bunch, you'll be in big fights. Um, get yourself maybe 10 Legos that match. Sit back to back and have somebody, have one person tell the other how to build something. Okay? It's very, very interesting to see the communication that patterns that arise out of it. So I used to do this a lot in family therapy. It's always interesting in family therapy because I do it, and you'd have young kids screaming at the parent, and you're like, "Whoa!" And then the parent be like, "Excuse me," and I'd be like, "Where do you think they learned it?" And I was like, "Oh, <laughs> right." That's what it does: is it unlocks your communication patterns and helps you realize how do you communicate with one another. So take the Legos and then swap, and have the other person tell you. Okay, it could be anything. It's pure creativity. Take the red Lego and put it on this brick. You got it? Don't look. Right? You only take, you cannot look at it. You have your back to one another. That's a fun way to do it. So if you have Legos, give it a shot. Um, we've done it. To be honest, in all our time, um, and, and, and rather in all my time of doing this, and I used to do this with a lot of clients, I had one parent-child get it right. Hmm. I had couples do it. I had families do it. I had one get it perfectly right. And I did this a lot. Because what you, it's like, it's not that difficult. It really is because you go to the left one, yeah, I got it. And then they just do it. It's like, slow down and listen. Notice the communication pattern. You're not listening. You didn't ask clarifying questions. You just went ahead and did it, and you started, the, the very first brick was wrong. And when the first brick was wrong, what do you think of, what else is built on there, right? So it really unlocks the communication patterns as to what's happening. My wife and I own this. Fantastic. Table topics, that's more of the love map creating type thing. Um, questions to start great conversations. Not a Christian thing, but, you know, so there may, I, I can't remember, there may be a cuss word or two in some of these. I don't think, but really good. They'll open some communication. Doors Table Topics has come out with a ton for families and everything else for game nights. Um, the couples one is fun, and it just helps create. So Melissa and I, we got to get back to it when we get home. Um, we just have the box sitting on top of our nightstand, and we'll pull, pull some of these. We've been through most of them. Um, dream again. Set logistics aside. What I call logistical marriages, um, those are, again, did you pick up this at the store? Did you take the kids to soccer practice? Did you do this? Did you do that? It's all logistics. Dream. Have fun with it. That's what marriage is for. That's what building intimacy is all about is, is dreaming of what you're going to do next. Where are you going to travel the world? You may have $2 in your bank account. It doesn't matter. Dream about traveling the world. Dream about doing something together. What got you into the relationship in the first place? What caused you to fall in love with this person? What we do is we... we Fall in love, and then what happens? We go into logistics. We go into, okay, well, there's this and this and this. All the responsibility and no fun of marriage, and we wonder why people are getting divorced after 25, 30 years. They fell out of love. No, you didn't fall out of love. You stopped working at it. You stopped doing what made it work in the first place. You stopped dreaming. You stopped scheming. You stopped having a ton of fun with the relationship. 
So we got to get back to that. And last, discuss sexual preferences, um, slash, actually I don't think it's last, um, but discuss sexual preferences, reservations, things to stimulate arousal. Certain, you know, hey, can you massage my back this way, or, or let's have this discussion, or whatever it may be, to find out what their sexual preferences are. If you want to increase intimacy, understand in the foreplay aspect, understand how to help your partner feel safe, feel loved, feel worthy of your love, feel like they belong in the bedroom, like everything is good, you have to start with, with discussing these things with the preferences, with the, I'm not comfortable with that, okay? Okay, we'll back off on that, right? How do we simulate arousal? How do we get one another to desire each other in that way? Talk about these things. Increase that communication to increase the intimacy. Um, that was the last one. So I think we are basically out of time, right? One minute, all right. I got time for one question. <laughs> oh, I, I just had a comment. Uh, we husbands are leaders, but we're servant leaders. True. Here's what servant, here's, here's, I agree with it. Here's unfortunately what our society has done with servant leaders. We take what is supposed to be the top, we put it on the bottom, we push from the bottom. That's not servant leadership, in my opinion. Leadership is somebody who takes the bullets. They are leading first, and they are saying, this is where we're going. Servant leadership steps to the back and goes, I'm going to let, I'm going to lead by delegation and let everybody else decide what they want to do. And then I'll, I'll take that. That's not leadership. Leadership is we're doing this in our relationship. We're following. Doesn't mean the wife will always like it. Doesn't mean the kids will always appreciate it, but they have to respect it from God. He also needs to take into consideration what they're saying. But that's my understanding of leadership is we love one another. We cherish what they have to say. We communicate so we know where they're going, but somebody has got to take the lead and say, this is what we're doing. Like so, Christ. Correct. Exactly. Christ is, is the perfect example of leadership where, yes, he gets down and washes the disciples' feet, but don't think for a moment that if it came down to taking a stand for something, he would hide behind the disciples or the apostles. He'd be first and foremost because he was. That's what husbands are to be, right, is the first and foremost, making the difficult decisions for the family, leading the way, and even if they aren't loved for it, they will be respected. And that's what men need. That's Ephesians 5, mm -hmm. right, is women, uh, wives, respect your husbands, and husbands love your wives because women need love, men need respect. That's the love and respect book, right? Um, which is really good. But yeah, so that's that's a good comment. We definitely want to make sure that we're servant leaderships. Part of being a servant is listening, but then it's taking lead, right? So good comment. Any other comments before we wrap up? We'll be back in 15 minutes. All right, guys. Yeah, okay, cool. Thanks.